On this edition of Sightings, you can check in anytime you want, but beware of ghosts. There is an evil presence there. An ongoing sightings investigation, residual haunting. Then, from America's UFO hotspot, startling new evidence of alien visitation. I think it's some kind of uh, alien craft, if you ask me. Plus, did this young genius live before? When he was only maybe a week old, he was conducting Mozart. Also, a psychic detective helps fight crime in Alabama. I do this work because it gives me a great pleasure to get killers. Jules Verne and H.G. Wells predicted a future that's now history. H.G. Wells envisioned the A-bomb. Is today's science fiction tomorrow's fact? The 40% chance that we're going to ruin this world is to me horrifying. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. One of our sightings investigative teams is studying a haunting case right now in Northern California, where apparitions, poltergeists, eerie sounds, odors, and electrical disturbances have all been reported. It's the old Brookdale Lodge, a dilapidated country inn that over the last half century has played host to everyone from presidents to Satan worshipers and stands on the site of a Native American burial ground. Built in 1924, the Brookdale Lodge is a place where visitors can touch a piece of history and a place where some people believe history touches them back. It's impossible to live there and not feel it. Uh, it's going on all around you. I believe there's something. It attacks people who seem to be the most vulnerable. I do believe in ghosts. I never had before, but I do now. In 1990, San Francisco Police Lieutenant Bill Gilbert bought the historic lodge and began a massive restoration effort. Since then, Bill, his family, and employees have all felt an uneasy presence. I was cleaning the tables, and when I looked up, I saw this little girl. Um, her, her face, her image was on the other side of the window, and um, couldn't see any of her body except for the top part of her. She was staying in the same spot. It was like she was pressed right against the window. Ross Gibson is a local historian who believes that the sighting of the little girl may be connected to a tragic episode he has discovered in the lodge's history. One of the tragedies of that era was when the niece of the uh, lodge owner drowned in the famous uh, brook. The centerpiece of the Brookdale Lodge has always been a natural brook running through the middle of the dining room. It has been the lodge's claim to fame, but also its undoing. In 1955, a terrible flood raced through the lodge. And then the following year, just as they were getting back on their feet, the uh, famous dining room burned down. I walked into the brook room. That's where the river runs through the restaurant. And the second I walked into the room, a hot sensation came over my lips. Jennifer Gilbert, the owner's daughter, did not immediately associate the burning sensation on her lips with a ghostly presence. I came back again on a separate occasion and I had the same sensation on my lips and then it happened several times after that and I started to believe then. The eerie activity in the Brookdale Lodge has all the earmarks of what paranormal investigators call a residue haunting. The theory is that events from the past are permanently imprinted on the environment and can then be experienced in the present. In conjunction with the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research, Sightings is conducting a long-term study on residue haunting. Previously, we brought you our investigations of the schoolhouse in Bodega Bay, California, and Old St. Petersburg High in Florida. We monitor everything from background radiation, electrostatic fields, um, spectrum of light, uh, the air content. We look for a rational explanation. We try to see if, uh, if someone's feeling cold air, if there is, in fact, um, a design of the building which is making cold air move through the place. Kim Gilbert is just one of many people who has experienced anomalous hot and cold spots inside the lodge. It's not a draft. It's not the sun shining through the walls. It's definitely something is there, and you can feel it. You're repelled by it. You want to get away. 
While OSIR monitors the lodge interior with scientific instruments and surveillance cameras, Sightings has also asked psychic Sylvia Brown to give us her impressions of what could be causing the haunting activity. Almost immediately, she felt the presence of two strong entities. And one is Sarah, and the other one is this grumpy, cranky, round, rotund man. Could this be what police lieutenant and current owner Bill Gilbert has reported seeing? As I walked into the lobby, there's a red couch near the door, and it would be to the far side. And I, I, there would be a just a, like a mirage or something. I didn't see. I couldn't say it's the figure of a human being or whatever. What the police officer saw was the figure of this man. Sylvia attempted to make contact with this supposed figure from the past. She claimed to receive psychic messages that the spirit was a judge, or used the name judge. Judge. Is that your name, Judge? The site was bought in 1870 by the Grover Lumber Company. And in 1900, they sold the property to Judge Logan. And he converted their old headquarters into Brookdale Lodge. There is a negative energy with this male. He just doesn't want anything changed. Your lodge, your land, I see. Sylvia believes the spirit of Judge Logan is angry and that it is responsible for the destruction that has occurred in the lodge over the years. I live right in the lodge and there's, um, uh, there's been do um, the doors broken off of the, the hinges. There's been um, planks torn off the walls. It was from the inside and it was like the tearing off of something um, supernatural. To determine if the eyewitnesses were experiencing a paranormal event, OSIR first attempted to rule out any environmental factors that might be influencing them. OSIR has found that certain chemicals present in soil and water can sometimes create haunting-like experiences. We look for radon in the air, toxic or hazardous chemicals, and these are chemicals which can create a hallucinogenic effect on the people and make them imagine that they're having experiences. But these factors were not present, and eyewitnesses insist that they have seen things that cannot be hallucinations. When I went into the um, Brook room with my sister once, there was a pinball machine on the side. All the lights were on, it was just going crazy. And we looked down, and it was unplugged. I was scared. What we find in a lot of hauntings is they exude electricity. And they will come make a light go on that is unplugged, the pinball machine. It's like, again, the scream. Please, somebody notice that I'm here. Sometimes late at night when I'm locking up by myself, I'll hear a whole bunch of music, like old time music, and I think it's coming outside and I'll follow it, and it's coming from the brook room, and it's coming from, from by the kitchen, and I'll hear dishes um, banging around, and like someone's having a party, and I, I walk into it, and there's absolutely nobody there. In its heyday, Many celebrities came here, which included Hollywood stars. This was also a favorite spot for uh, the headliners of the big band era. In the Mermaid Room, an underwater floor show once entertained visitors in the 30s and 40s. Today, many people have seen a different kind of visitor in the Mermaid Room. I saw, like, the glimpse of this child. And so I looked, you know, twice, and it just sort of disappeared. This is really where the uh, major influence of the uh, girl is. She's jumping, she's skipping, and she stops at this point. I can see her, and she pulls up her white stockings. Later, in the Brook Room, Sylvia Brown felt the child's presence once again, and then envisioned a chilling scenario. All of a sudden, from the side comes a dark woman with a big braid. The child spins around, and the woman seems like she's pushing. And the child tumbles and falls. She drowned. Was a child named Sarah murdered here? Police records say no, but a supernatural force within the lodge seems to be saying yes. The area itself, and especially the lodge, is a very beautiful place. Um, but there is an evil presence there. The Brookdale Lodge is a beautiful location, and based on eyewitness testimony and the separate investigations of Sylvia Brown and the OSIR, it appears to be a location that bears the residue of the past, both the violent and the playful. Certainly after conducting our investigation, initially here at the Brookdale Lodge, we found a variety of very unusual 
uh, phenomenon. The data that we documented showed specifically certain areas of floors which seemed to uh, produce what looked like footsteps walking through various parts of the structure. The Bursts of air were monitored in both wind velocity and with thermovision to accurately determine the temperature. However, we were not able to determine exactly where the air was coming from. And in fact, the experiences people are having here are very real and, and that they are perhaps in some way uh, a ghost or a residue haunting taking place. Our investigation at Brookdale Lodge is ongoing. Although we have the most sophisticated detection equipment currently available, no one has yet figured out how to get a ghost to appear when and where you want it to. When sightings continues, what in the world is it? Is this videotape evidence of an extraterrestrial visitation? Could be some kind of a military craft. I doubt it, though. Gulf Breeze, Florida continues to garner worldwide attention because of a persistent UFO flap sighted there since 1986. There are hours of film and videotape documenting UFO sightings over Gulf Breeze. Much of it shot by one man, Ed Walters. Skeptics argue that this is highly suspicious and challenge Walters' veracity. But now there is new videotape and new film of UFOs over Gulf Breeze, and none of it comes from Ed Walters. What in the world is it? It's a question that residents in Gulf Breeze, Florida have been asking for almost 10 years. There have been over 1,000 individual sightings of unidentified flying objects, beginning in 1986, with this historic photograph taken by Ed Walters. Since then, Walters and others continue to capture UFOs on film and tape. The activity in our area has certainly not stopped. It has never stopped, and it looks like it's on the increase, hopefully. There's a lot more people willing to, to acknowledge that they've had a sighting uh, than, than, you know, five years ago. People were much more quiet about it. The sightings in Gulf Breeze have become more frequent, in large part because groups of amateur ufologists now scan the skies nightly. And the nation's largest UFO research organization, MUFON, now has a branch office here, headed by Art Hufford. The purpose of our local MUFON organization, I think, is really twofold. Uh, one is to investigate, uh, to investigate using the best scientific methods we can, uh, UFO sighting reports, uh, close encounters, adoption experiences. And then secondly, to, uh, to try to educate, to share what we learn locally and also what we learn from what's going around the country and around the globe. One of the most dramatic UFO encounters to date occurred on April 28, 1994. Ken and Carol Baker were driving home, and as this simulation demonstrates, the Bakers claimed to have seen two glowing orbs. What the Bakers saw is similar to videotape of two bright UFOs shot in the same area, hovering over the Gulf Breeze shoreline. At approximately 10.40 at night, my wife was driving me to my place of employment. I looked at the front windshield, and we saw a white object. I, I looked out, and I didn't know what it was I was looking at and it was round like a bubble. Around this light, or around this bubble, was a smaller light that seemed to be orbiting around it. I try to be scientific in all the things that I, I deal with. I was in the Air Force for seven years, and I've seen different crafts, different ships we have. It wasn't anything we had seen before. With the increasing number of sightings by credible townspeople and new videotape evidence, even hardened skeptics believe something is going on over Gulf Breeze. But is it a UFO? There's a program afoot to try to slowly educate people all over the world that we're not alone. Who knows, maybe one of those days we'll have that uh, uh, landing on the White House lawn experience where no longer is there any doubt that they're here, they're among us. Sitting in the sky, some kind of, could be some kind of a military craft, I guess. I doubt it, though. It's some kind of uh, an alien craft, you ask me. Gulf Breeze resident Ed Walters has also captured a new UFO on film. This Polaroid instant picture shows an unidentified craft offshore with what appears to be water spout activity just below it. Optical physicist Dr. Bruce McAbee enlarged and examined the snapshot, and he sent us this lengthy report. In his opinion, the water spout UFO is not a fake. 
Dr. Maccabee, a civilian scientist with the U.S. Navy, joins us now to discuss his findings. Dr. Maccabee, you conclude that this photograph is not a fake. Does that mean it is a genuine UFO? I'd say the chances are very small that that could be a hoax. In this case, the sighting, as reported by Ed, lasted a couple of minutes at the most. But to put a large object out there in the middle of the Santa Rosa Sound would probably take hours. Dr. McAbee, Ed Walters has been a key figure in the photographs and in the logging of activity in Gulf Breeze. Is it likely that one individual would be more prone to see and experience UFOs than some other individual? Ed Walters certainly has been a focus of a lot of attention. But for about two and a half years, starting in November 1990 and running through July 1992, uh, a group of people I call the Gulf Breeze research team down there went out virtually every night, logged about 180 or so sighting events, a few of which Ed attended. But most of those sightings, the witnesses were uh, people who lived in the area, mm -hmm. people who are just traveling through the area, tourists and so on. Dr. McAbee, how do your professional colleagues react to your interest in UFOs and your willingness to go out on a limb to say that there's something here? So I should point out, by the way, I uh, do work at a Navy laboratory. And I have found that virtually every government laboratory, and I presume most civilian laboratories around the country, have people who are interested in this subject, uh, just as there are people in virtually, I guess, all walks of life who have a sincere interest in finding out what the truth is. Dr. Bruce McAbee, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Next on Sightings, did this child's super intelligence come from a past life? When he was only maybe a week old, he was conducting Mozart in perfect time. In a controversial social experiment, Robert Graham opened the Repository for Germinal Choice in 1980. Better known as the Genius Pool, Graham created an elite sperm bank where only geniuses are accepted as donors. And the first boy born through the program is, in fact, of superior intelligence, with an IQ approaching 200. But the boy, who's now 12, doesn't credit his donor father. He believes that he draws his knowledge from past lives. I think that um, the soul is on a journey, and um, at, at, at different times it will choose to accomplish different sorts of things. Even before he was born, Doran Blake's family knew he would be an exceptional child. When he was only maybe a week old, he was conducting Mozart in perfect time. Doran is a child prodigy who has made headlines, at first for the mere fact of his unique conception, and later for his remarkable talents. Uh, two, I bought him a computer, which he immediately learned to use. He is, I think, a computer genius. By age six, Doran had written his first book, the Adventure of George the Dinosaur. He had an uncanny grasp of literature and began to recite Hamlet from memory. He started to read in kindergarten. He was in a very special school. In one year, he was reading Shakespeare, from starting from nothing. Was Doran simply the product of genetic manipulation, or could there be another explanation for his amazing intellect? At three, he suddenly said to his mother, do you remember the time when uh, uh, when uh, you and I lived in California before there were any big buildings and I was your wife and we lived in these houses draped with straw. Doran's family believes these memories are not fantasy, but rather spontaneous recall of events from Doran's past lives. I think I've lived all sorts of past lives, uh, primarily probably having to do with science and math and writing, and um, I know I've lived several in uh, Egypt as um, a healer. Um, I know in one life I was an actor in, in, the, in Shakespeare's Guild about 50 years after he died, and I did his plays and everything like that. Doran believes he has the ability to recall information from his past lives and use it in the present. I believe that some of the, the, the a, a portion of the knowledge or intelligence that you have in certain fields or certain things in this lifetime comes from other lifetimes, but not completely, not 100%. I think it's also from genes and, and, and genetics and such. Winifred Lucas has researched many of the people and events her grandson has been recalling since he was three years old. What she discovered has made her a believer. 
everything that he had picked up when he was three was absolutely true, including the houses draped with straw. And that, and he had had a life as a Shumash Indian. Then he began to talk about Afghanistan. When he was four and a half, he'd say, Grandma, what's been happening in Afghanistan? I said, why are you so interested in, in Afghanistan? He said, well, I had two lifetimes there, Grandma, and I blew them. Recently, Doran underwent a past life regression the therapist Tinnicky Nordograph. He believes that the session helped him delve deeper into the lives he has led before. What's the very first thing that comes to mind? The raging rocks and shivering shocks. Gifted children, they have skills they cannot have developed in only this lifetime. So if we go back to where they developed them, we find often other lifetimes. And I think that the soul is looking for completion. But science has a much different take on the source of Doran's abilities. The things that this child does, is able to do, are very difficult to comprehend. There is no complete explanation for the prodigy. The prodigy has puzzled and mystified for centuries. That doesn't necessarily lead us to the conclusion that the reason that he's able to do them is because of past life experience. It can be part of a tradition that runs through a family. It can be part of the biological passing down through the generations of, uh, of genetic material. Winifred has come to believe that Doran's high IQ has been passed down to him, not just by her family, but also by the reincarnated soul within him. When Doran was, in, was six years old, the teacher asked what they wanted for Christmas. And kids were making lists, and Doran wrote, I want peace on earth and happiness for the world and joy for the Christians and happiness for the Jews. Is this sympathetic worldview attributable to his past lives? Doran believes so, and is currently writing a book about the hidden relationship between intelligence and reincarnation. I spent a couple lifetimes in um, preparing for what I think this lifetime is going to be the, the lifetime where I intend to satisfy a part of the journey of my soul, helping make the world a better place to live. Generally, people have not known why some people are much brighter than others, why Mozart could write a symphony at four, you know? And uh, I think that part of the trouble was that we didn't believe there were other lifetimes, so we didn't know how to explain it. Doran Blake, the author of The Adventure of George the Dinosaur, has written three new books due to be published this year. One book is called My Nine Lives, an autobiographical account of Doran's past life regressions. Coming up next, the police have reached a dead end, and a psychic detective provides startling clues in an unsolved murder. This is him. He's the one who did the murder. Then, a young boy sends a message from the afterlife, and sci-fi prophets offer a vision of the future. Psychic detective Dorothy Allison has worked with sightings on a number of cases, and she has an impressive track record, providing police with important leads that help solve crimes. Well, now she's investigating a murder in rural Alabama that has stumped the authorities. She would do anything for her children. She would have just done anything for us. When she grew roses, she gave them to people. If she cut them, she didn't take them in the house for herself. She gave them to somebody. And that was the kind of person she was. She was a giving person. I can always remember the way she smelled and how warm and close it felt when she told me. And the sound of her voice when she sang to me. Those are the main things I remember. It was always so loving. When I found out how old she was, and I thought to myself, if anybody could go and do this to a woman of her age, then you could do anything to anybody. Then you're not even worthy of walking the streets. 74-year-old Edna Youngblood Reeves was loved. But when she made headlines in 1993, it wasn't because of her 49-year marriage, or her smile, or the simple, happy life she'd built in her hometown of Troy, Alabama. It was because she had been brutally murdered, and no one knew why. Edna Youngblood Reeves was a uh, elderly white female who lived alone at her residence at Route 2 Troy at approximately 11.15 a.m. August the 14th, 1993. 
Her body was discovered uh, at her residence. Theme was probably in 22 years of law enforcement experience, the most sinister case we've ever worked. At this point in time, there is not a known named suspect for that murder. Along with state law enforcement agencies, Deputy Sheriff Bob Bradbury has worked tirelessly searching for the killer who is still out there somewhere. The conspicuous lack of any suspect is something new for Deputy Sheriff Bradbury and the town of Troy. When you have a murder in Pike County, generally speaking, the perpetrator is either on the scene or you have a witness who says it was old so-and-so and he left going such and such a direction. A sighting of an unfamiliar red and white car at Edna's house on the day of the murder has been the only solid lead. The owner has never been identified. The case is at a standstill, but the sheriff's department refuses to give up. They'll try anything to solve Edna's murder, even a psychic detective. And I told them what I wanted, which was the victim's date of birth and the day of the crime. And this is all I have asked for. That's, that's what I've got here right now. I've never had dealings with a psychic. Uh, this will be a new ground for me. Uh, from what I've been told, Dorothy can help, and uh, the investigation is to a point where we need all the help we can get. At the invitation of the Pike County Sheriff's Department, Dorothy Allison traveled to Troy, Alabama. The only information she was given prior to her visit was Edna's birth date and the date of the murder. I believe that when she's in my mother's house in the room where the person who killed her was, that she may be able to connect with some part of that person, that she may be able to tell who it was. The best thing for me to do is to go on to the scene, see it myself. This is so that I get a good feeling of that killer. How did he walk in the house? What room did he go into? Why did he commit the murder? And we obviously haven't told you which room the body was discovered in. Can you tell us? I felt that it was a bedroom. I get a bed. Can you tell us which bedroom? Well, I'll have to walk around and see that. I get this room. Dorothy's feelings led her here, to Edna's bedroom. Dorothy said this is where Edna died. There it is. No, I would get this room then. This room is very, very important. The hangers, the, that's what he killed her with. She was found laying in her bedroom dead with a coat hanger around her neck, strangled and dead, and later found out she was sexually assaulted. When she entered the oh, kitchen, here, here. Dorothy Are began to give her psychic impressions of the killer. I feel that the killer actually came into this kitchen before he killed her or after, maybe after. Opened this up and drank some orange juice out of the refrigerator as though if somebody caught me here, well, it wouldn't matter. They, uh, I have a right to be here, in other words. So if he was a, a man who comes around fixing washing machines or refrigerators, whatever, he certainly felt at ease. She was able to pinpoint the room that the uh, crime took place in. She was able to give us some more information as to landmarks, uh, possible suspect names, and possible suspect vehicle. I get somebody, I would say, the age is between 25 and 30. Dorothy worked with retired NYPD composite artist Bob Filios to create a drawing of Edna's killer. I would say he's about 5 foot 7, 5 foot 8. This is how he appears to me. I would say he's about 145 to 165 pounds. Even though he's not that good looking, he's a very conceited person. But he feels inadequate or he wouldn't have done what he did. I like getting the killers for what they've done. I like that coward caught. Dorothy believes that she has seen the face of a murderer and that he must be caught or he will kill again. I feel this is it, this is him. He's the one who did the murder. That's the face I'm looking for. This should give the cops a clue. What the, uh, the clincher will be is the, uh, the composite sketch. Uh, hopefully that'll put the nail in somebody's coffin. There is a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Edna Reeves' murderer. 
If you have any information about this case, the Pike County Sheriff's Department in Troy, Alabama would like to hear from you. When sightings continues. He said that suicide is never, ever correct for a young person. A mother communicates with her son 18 years after his death. Shortly before his death, Harry Houdini, the great magician, vowed that if there was any way to communicate from beyond the grave, he would. Well, we're still waiting. Skeptics say that that proves that there is no such thing as after-death communication. But what if speaking from beyond the grave isn't a choice that's ours to make? What if it's a gift bestowed to a special few who have an important message? Stephen was one of the most uh, happy, funny, joke-playing kids around. And he was bright in school. Everything came very easy to him and had a great uh, searching mind. He would read everything that he could. He would write these things and um, way beyond what his age was. But Stephen had another side he didn't show to the world. While family and friends saw an outgoing athletic Stephen, there was also a withdrawn, troubled adolescent who spent hours in his room writing in a private journal. His stepfather and I had divorced and we had moved away from where he had grown up and spent most of his life. He became even quieter and very much into himself. Every day he would complain about going to school and this is a kid who was straight A's who loved school. He usually called me every afternoon at 3 o'clock and said, Hi, Mom, this is Steve, and, uh, or this is me, and would tell me what he planned to do that day, or I'd give him instructions, and he didn't call. And I got home, and he wasn't there, and I said, Where's Steven? And the girl said he, he said he was going camping in the woods. Well, I was really put out with him. It was a school night, and I thought, okay, he's 15 years old. He's going to spend the night in the woods, and maybe he'll come home, and we'll have a long talk. About um, 3 o'clock, the kids came home from school, and we were sitting around, and there was a knock on the door, and two detectives came in. When they told me that they'd found his body, I felt like somebody hit me in the stomach with a sledgehammer. It was the most horrendous thing. I couldn't even cry. I hurt so bad. The little boy would never grow to be a man. Stephen was only 15 when he hung himself. His mother searched for a reason why and turned to his journal. The messages she found there were cryptic, promising that someday he would return. It didn't make sense until a few days after his death when Stephen's promise seemed to be coming true. The first thing that happened was about two or three days after he died, we were preparing for his memorial service. And my friend from um, Scotland was taking care of the house while I went to the grocery store. And I came home and she said, Anne, Anne, I just heard from Stephen. She said, I heard his footsteps, and then he began to speak, and here's what he told me. And she wrote it down and read it to me, and it was, I'm okay, Mom. As soon as I'm stronger, I'll talk to you. Um, you didn't do this. Bill Guggenheim is a researcher who has collected over 3,000 first-hand accounts of people who claim they have had contact with deceased loved ones. He believes that after-death communication is a natural part of the grieving process. We believe that after-death communications are a natural and normal part of our human existence. And they're not supernatural, paranormal, new age, psychic, mystic, occult. And to prove this, that our conservative estimate is that one out of five Americans, or 20% of the entire population, has had at least one after-death communication experience. That translates into 50 million people. Shortly after he died, I was in the house, sitting in the front room. I looked to my left, and towards the kitchen area, and he was standing right there in his karate gi. I get this frantic call from home, and it's my eight-year-old daughter, Debbie. She goes, Mom, come home quick. Stephen was just here. This child was just absolutely frantic from this experience. Stephen's family does not believe they are hallucinating. Their experiences have been too tangible. There is a Christmas tree that has a music box that's made from ceramic. And uh, the music box had stopped working years ago. And it was Christmas time, and all the decorations are out. and. The room is quiet, and the light, the tree, the tree comes on, the lights go on, and the music starts to play. And looking, we're all looking very confused at each other, and it was there. The energy was there. It was Stevens here. He's just here to share. And this was his way of saying, 
Hi. Actually, we believe that, uh, that children and other loved ones are there around their parents and other family members continuously, initially, trying to break through, trying to have somebody hear them. Stephen's mother believes that he did break through. She started hearing Stephen's voice, and the voice was telling her to write down what he was saying. He had a watch with a broken mainspring, and he told me to take it with me. He said every time he came in the room to dictate to me, he'd make the watch go. And he'd say, look at the watch. And the watch would be going second after second. and would run while he was in the room. When he'd leave the room, the watch would stop. Anne claims that Stephen had been given a special assignment from a higher power. His assignment, after he made the transition, was to work with me to help me bring out information to help save the lives of children. He said, first of all, that suicide is never, ever correct for a young person, even if they have a terminal illness. There's such a life force in a young person that there's always hope for them. The underlying message of all ADCs is that life is continuous. In a sense, we are in eternity now. This is eternal life. This is a school for learning lessons. Was Stephen's family actually receiving messages from beyond the grave, or were they simply experiencing a powerful form of wish fulfillment? Guggenheim believes after-death communication is both a melding of intuition and reality. The number one fear in America is a fear of death. And the psychologist will tell you if, to the extent that we fear death, we withhold from life. 19 years after her son's death, and Perrier continues to believe that she is communicating with and taking dictation from her son Stephen. She's published his messages in this book, Stephen Lives. The Perriers also continue to try to record or document the after-death communication only they can hear. And they help other bereaved families try to do the same. I won't tell you that I wouldn't rather Stephen was here. I would a hundred times rather he was here. I'd trade it all for that. But he's not, and we have to make the best of it. So when you lose a child, you have to come to some peace within yourself about what occurred. Since 1983, the Logos Center, founded by the Per Years, has helped hundreds of teenagers choose not to commit suicide. They also provide support groups for parents who have lost a child to suicide. The Per Years are trying to create something positive out of their family tragedy. Next on Sightings, sci-fi prophets offer a vision of the future. You'll have the choice as to what you'll look like. You can make yourself beautiful, you can have a designer body. Great science fiction writers of the past, like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, did more than create compelling fiction. They created a view of the future, one that, a hundred years later, reads like non-fiction. Are there science fiction writers today who have the same visionary power? Who among them will stand the test of time 100 years from now? There have been tens of thousands of works of science fiction written since the 1800s. It's a genre that has become synonymous with fantasy, but many of the modern inventions we use today were first envisioned by the great science fiction writers of the past. And one 19th century writer stands head and shoulders above the rest. To this day, Jules Verne has the best record of predicting, and that's simply because he predicted going to the moon, rocketry, orbits, submarines. He was fantastic. Verne may be the most prolific, but many other science fiction writers of the past also made prophetic predictions. There's a charming and, and rather interesting uh, prediction that Lester Del Rey made in one of his stories about the name of the first man on the moon. He chose a good, strong American name. He said this man's name will be Armstrong. Today, their genius is clear, but many such writers went unrecognized in their own time. Paris in the 20th century was rejected by Jules Verne's editor as too fantastic to be believable. His vision of Paris, just published this year for the first time, is remarkably similar to the Paris of today. Originally written in 1863, Verne describes Paris in 1960 as a city illuminated by electrified mercury wire fed by underground cables. He wrote these words years before light bulbs were a reality. Verne also described streets crowded with cars powered by internal combustion gas engines. Henry Ford was born the year this passage was written. He also describes a device he calls the photographic telegraph that can instantly send letters across a continent. He envisioned a fax machine nearly a century before its invention. And it was a, a fairly uh, a pessimistic look at the future with a lot of technology thrown in. 
But it wasn't the pessimistic tone that kept the book from publication. Ironically, on one manuscript page, Verne's editor wrote, My dear Verne, had you been a prophet, no one today would believe your prophecy. The most powerful form of science fiction is a prediction that the science fiction author does not want to come true. Instead, he or she wants it to become a self-preventing prophecy. But instead of being embraced as cautionary tales, many early works became the blueprints for mass destruction. The development of lots of military technology has come from people who have envisioned it before. H.G. Wells envisioned the tank, uh, and the A-bomb was foretold. H.G. Wells was ridiculed when he wrote about atomic weapons in 1914, but in 1945, there was Hiroshima. It is only with the power of 2020 hindsight that we know just how accurate Wells, Verne, and others really were. And perhaps it should serve as a warning to listen with an open mind to the science fiction writers of today. They, too, are offering a cautionary tale. I think as the 19th century was dominated by mechanics and chemistry, and the 20th century, obviously, by physics, the next century will be dominated by biology. The really difficult part will come when it becomes possible in about 20 years to modify ourselves. You'll have the choice as to what you'll look like. You can make yourself beautiful, you can make your children beautiful, you can make them healthy, you can look like a non-human being, you can have a designer body. To directly reach in and modify people, that's going to provoke a huge crisis, and it's coming. It cannot be avoided. And that'll probably lead to health problems, and so we're going to have all the fashion magazines full of why you should not change your body every six months just to fit fashion. These are disturbing thoughts, and because they're disturbing, they make great storylines. Despite their compelling visions of the future, great science fiction writers are quick to dismiss the idea that they are prophets. My feeling is that science fiction doesn't function very well as prophecy. I think it functions much better as a warning, as an inspiration. We can have dreams about the future, but we will never have a crystal ball that will show us the future clearly. I think we have a very rough 50 years ahead of us as a race and, a, and as a planet, at the end of which I give us 60% odds of having an absolutely dazzling civilization that we would have been proud, anybody on this planet would be proud to leave their children. The 40% chance that we're going to ruin this world is to me horrifying. And every person should wake up every day thinking about how can I help? David Brin points out that a writer's imagination can produce astonishing insights about the future. The details, however, are sometimes a bit fuzzy. In 1868, E. E. Hale, an early American futurist, predicted communication satellites would one day beam electronic messages around the world. Unfortunately, he also predicted that they would be made out of brick and powered by a waterfall. Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sighting stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, The Sentinel. Enter an alien realm where sea monsters are real. Sharks feeding frenzy. Then explore the dark depths of fear, the conclusion of The Beast. Get out of the water! Tonight, beginning at 8 p.m. on Sci-Fi.